Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks, RJ. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so, let's get this thing started. This right here is the house that I grew up in. This is just a suburban house on a regular suburban street. Uh, this is where I spent most of my childhood. And like any house, it had a kitchen. And in that kitchen was a junk drawer. You know, there's no reason to do this here. There's no reason to talk about junk drawers and stuff like that. Like that's, that's great and there's something there, but I don't wanna talk with you today about that stuff. I'm just, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna kind of reboot this a little bit. So let me skip through a couple things here and get to the, the heart of the matter, right? So we got some Beyonce, we got some smoothies, we got this, which is important, uh, we got a hamster. All right, so let's reboot this. One of the things that I hear a lot in my line of work is the work I do is magic, right? People don't know what I do. I do user experience design. People don't get it. That's cool, right? Um, people think that I you know, go ahead and make things pretty or I make things functional or I put things on paper. I do presentations and PowerPoint, stuff like that. But one of the things that I do hear a lot is I don't know how you do it. My extremely good friend and colleague, Pranilla, <laughs> slacked me one day a while ago and basically said, I don't know how you do it all. She added that qualifier, which is big. And my reply was, I, I don't do it all. That's how I do it all, right? So one of the things that I want to do today as a magician of the arts of user experience is reveal all my tricks, all of them, for you today. Now, the guarantee here is that if you follow these specific steps, everything you do will be magical, OK? Small promise, but you'll get there. Um, just for an example, I followed these steps on Monday when it was trash day, and I took out the trash, and it was magical. It was magical. The trash disappeared. I don't know how it happened. Um, it was magical the other day when I sent an email to a colleague and used an emoji. It was totally magical. It was fantastic and amazing. So we only have 27 steps to get through in our time together, OK? I took a look at my creative process, backed it out a little bit, and realized, yeah, this is doable in 27 steps, absolutely. So um, if you follow these steps one by one, you will be magical. I want that to be very clear, no matter what work you do. All right, got it? Good, okay. So we're not gonna repeat every step, but we'll repeat the first one. So step one, say it with me. Hear about an idea, great, thank you. That was magical, see, we did it. Um, so the very first thing, in all seriousness, with my creative process is, I hear about some idea, right? So it might be something that gets stuck in my noggin. It might be the fact that we have giant cotton candy in back, which is just glorious and beautiful. It might be a project that I'm assigned to and a really interesting problem I'm working on with clients. But that idea just kind of gets in my noggin in some fashion, right? That's where it starts. From there, I sit with that idea a little bit. I start to think, huh, how's this gonna work? How can I make this thing? What's this thing gonna look like, right? If I'm starting with this raw idea, this raw thing, could it be really great or is it going to be just crap? Is it a bad idea? I don't know, but I'm going to start with it and I'm going to sit with it a little bit more. Now, next step, make something. This is the third step right away. Like there are 24 more to go and I make something at the third step, magical. Um, the idea is to get it out now. It's in my head. I had this idea, this thing was there. Now, let's make it in the real world. Let's do something, something big or something small, whatever it's going to be, okay? So, step four. <laughs> it's horrible, it's shit, frankly. The thing that I made is crap, it is garbage. Um, it is the first draft of whatever I did. It is not good, okay? And that's a struggle for me because the very first thing that I wanna do is put something out in the world that is beautiful and perfect and ready to go right off the bat, right? I want that. I actually see heads nodding, which makes me very excited. Uh, <laughs> thank you, I make crap, you don't. Uh, so, but, but there are a couple things that I keep in mind here, right? One is, um, there, there's a gentleman by the name of Ira Glass. He runs a radio show, if you use a radio, that was a thing that transmits signals around, there are podcast versions of it, called This American Life. And a while ago, he put out a video on the internet about storytelling specifically. And the thing that I remember that stuck with me was this. He said that when you're starting out whatever you're doing, your taste level is gonna be up here, right? That is where your taste is in whatever subject it is, right? You start somewhere. But the thing that you make is gonna be like down here, right? 
So one of the goals of art and doing this work is to try to get to that level of taste that we have already as much as possible. Now, it doesn't mean you'll actually get there, right? That's the troubling part. You may put something out there, it may never reach your level of taste. But I see that as a very great mission to shoot for. Um, I want to do it on my first try, but I don't think I'm going to get there, honestly. Um, and on a similar note, another gentleman by the name of John Cleese, a uh, comedian, famous comedian, Monty Python, uh, wrote a bunch of books, gave a fantastic talk that is probably now about 25 years old. Um, and you can find it on YouTube with Swedish subtitles. I don't know why that is, it's just how it is now. Um, but he talks about his creative process. And he talks about one thing that's very important. He talks about the open mode and the closed mode. Okay? So the idea that he puts out there is that when you're starting with something, you want to be in an open mode as much as possible. Right? So any ideas, wacky ideas, terrible ideas, those are things that you want to bring in right away. You want to just not say no to any of these things. You want to take it all in. And then over time, when you start to refine an idea and sit with it and go for it, you want to go in that closed mode. So you become very focused. right? You hone in on one, two, maybe three ideas that really resonate with you, and you go for that, and you stay in that closed mode and see the thing through. So those things really stuck with me quite a bit insofar as you know, inspirational things from people on the internet, which I'm all about. So, all right. Let's see where we're at here. Uh, yep, that's a good time for some tweets. All right. Um, at, let's see if I can do this right. Let's see, I'm Denver. And in the middle of my talk, and I'm nervous, and doing something not related to the talk. Hello. All right, that should do it. And now, let's see. More importantly, um, I want to take a look at some shoes for a minute. That's cool. Uh, let's see. Cool. Those are pretty nice. OK. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. There's a talk. I'm sorry. There's a talk going on. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Um, step five in my creative process. Post funny comments on Twitter and shop for shoes or pants. This happens. This happens. I'm so sorry I didn't shop for pants. That would have been more entertaining, perhaps. But. Um, this happens. This is a part of my process. And then I come back and realize, oh yeah, that thing I put out there that's kind of half-baked is still there. It's still there. It's not done. It's still kind of crap. It's still there. And then I do something completely unrelated. right? This is where I um, most likely will get away from a screen, honestly, if I'm doing something digital. right? Um, I'll probably go for a walk. I'll probably go over and get a taco for lunch, because come on, uh, you have to. Um, but it's something that where I'm using an entirely different part of my noggin at that point. right? I don't want to engage that creative portion at all. Um, another thing I might do is spend a lot of time in Excel doing estimates for projects, which I actually, frankly, geek out about a little bit. I'm going to be honest with you. I kind of like Excel. Don't hold it against me. So I do that unrelated thing, I work through it, come back to the thing and it is still there. This thing that I'm making, if it were say, I don't know, a creative mornings talk in a Word document that's sitting on my desktop because I put stuff on my desktop on my Mac, it's still there and it's not done and it's not good. What am I gonna do? So what I do after that is I look to see what's driving me, right? If it's a project, odds are good there's a deadline I'm working up toward, right? Uh, if I'm doing, say, a Creative Mornings talk, for instance, there's a specific date that this needs to be done. This needs to be done today so I can share it with you today. Uh, is it done yet? No, we're working on it right now together. Uh, <laughs> we're figuring this out. Um, but there's something that will drive me, and, and sometimes it's not a deadline, right? I'm, I tend to be a pretty good planner and an organizer, but when it comes to this stuff, Sometimes it'll just be a need that I have to get something out. Sometimes I'll do a song or what have you, and my guitar skills are not very good. But I will do something and put it out in the world because I need to put it out in the world. So what I do since I'm planning, I become very productive. I schedule times to work on it. I feel very good about this. I mean, I'm telling you, folks, I put this on my calendar a lot. Um, for this talk, I did a rehearsal I set up every other day, every other night. It was perfect. It was great. Set up times with my coworkers to go over it. Those were great, too. Um, just getting that schedule in front of me was super duper helpful. And then, well, I, I just ignored that whole schedule. I was like, you know what? This is not working at all. I ignored the whole thing. 
And instead, I went back to the thing, in this case, this Word document where I did my work on this talk, and just edited the hell out of the thing, right? I started looking at the structure and saying, well, I use also and two together in sentences a lot. I got to get that out of here. This structure makes no sense. This flow is really weird. This is totally not working at all. So I edit aggressively on this stuff. And then I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I get scared, for real, for real. Um, the things I worry about are, what if this thing that I'm gonna put out in the world does not work, right? What if this is something that is going to fail miserably? Um, what if it's just a gigantic mess? What if the quality remains at this shit level? What if that happens? I get scared about that. I wanna put something out in the world, right? I wanna do something creative, but I also want it to be good, so I really struggle with that. But then, beautifully, it turns around and I get some confidence and it's like, yes, this is gonna be awesome, this is so good. Oh my God, this is so brilliant, this is wonderful. My ego really kicks in here and says, this is it, this is fantastic. What a wonderful thing you are going to do. And then, coffee. <laughs> Pretty good, I gotta say. Always coffee, always. I come back. In this case, with this talk, for instance, I update the draft, right? And what I do is I do another rehearsal, like I try it again. I record myself in my darkened back room and with my iPhone recording and the screen in front of me just talking through this stuff, right? I start to really sense like what's working, what's not working in this thing. Um, start to get a better idea of that as I say it out loud and talk with people about it, right? Because if you write, you know that if you write something, it sounds a lot different in your head than it does out loud. So that happens, unfortunately. That's the next step I do. Now, I want to stress that this next step is the most important step in the process. All right, especially that last clause. So now I've got a thing, right? It's half-baked. It's half-baked, I put it out there. I share it with friends and colleagues, right? I'll, I'll say like, hey, I'm working on a thing. I'm working on the Creative Mornings talk. Can I show you these slides that have this beautifully current stuff that I'm so happy and proud of? And I'm like, yes, this is great. I get that feedback, I feel really good about it, but I still talk about it in a very negative way. I say, oh yeah, this is a work in progress, it's not done yet, I know what I need to fix in this. I start to become super hypercritical of myself in this, right? So I'm putting it out there a little bit, but I'm very, very hesitant about it. Then I, I revise again, right? There's a heck of a lot of editing and iteration here. I take out the things that don't work. Um, I was uh, absolutely planning to make an Apple reference during the talk today, that's gone. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Nobody hears about Apple anymore, I know. Um, I, I absolutely wanted to make Beyonce references because for goodness sake, yes, but it didn't happen, except now, which is kind of meta. Um, <laughs> but that stuff, that it, it just wasn't, wasn't gelling, so I brought in more ideas. I thought, well, one thing I've always wanted to do is do an impossibly long list of things within a talk in a short period of time. Like, I've always wanted to break out a giant list of things and do it so it's ridiculous. Like 101 things in 30 minutes would be brilliant. What about 27 things in 20 minutes? That might work, maybe. We'll find out if that works or not. I'm not sure yet. Um, so I start to look at this and I say, this is too many things. Now I've got too much stuff in this, right? I edited this down, I brought in more ideas, and now it's too many things. So as they say in the business, I have to adjust the scope. I have to make a scope change, as they say. Um, and I start to look at it and say, you know, really, what, what can I get rid of now? Now what can I get rid of? This idea, this talk is coming along, right? I've got this idea of doing this, this numbered list on the screen, having it roll up behind me all the time, having people clearly very engaged and interested in every single word I'm talking about. I mean, this is, this is really kind of coming along a bit. So what I want to do is make sure that, you know, I've, I can take out some stuff and still hit the time that I need to hit on this. And then the next step is the most important step in the entire process. Stop me if you've heard that one before. Have a nightmare about it. <laughs> so about two weeks or so ago, um, I was very much in planning mode for this talk. Um, I had everything scheduled, right? So I rehearsed, it was writing in Word, it was like, this is crap, this is good, etc. And I found myself uh, one night waking up at about three o'clock. Woke up, realized I had a nightmare about this talk. This very talk that I'm giving right now. Y'all were here, you look, you look a lot better in real life, I'll be honest with you, you look good, <laughs> flattery. Uh, so I, I started talking and people started leaving, okay? People started getting up and walking out. 
And soon I realized I had no idea what I was talking about on stage. I was up there, I was nervous. I was just falling apart and collapsing. Um, it was a terrible nightmare. But then I realized, I thought about the last time I gave a big talk, which was a little while ago. And I realized, oh hey, I had that happen then too. So what I've come to realize is having a nightmare is absolutely a part of my creative process. My brain is thinking through this stuff for some reason in the middle of the night when I'd like to be dreaming about clearly shoes and pants. I mean, come on. Um, instead, I'm dreaming about the nervousness, the anxiety, the terror, the excitement and joy of giving a talk. That happens. That is something that I do, and I have no control over it. But isn't that really the creative process in, in essence, right? We do something, we have no control over it. Deep thoughts. Um, all right, so the nightmare happens, right? I wake up, go back to sleep, hopefully, wake up, go for a run, uh, and then I come back to the original idea. I go back to where I started, and I say, hey, this idea is, that was a pretty good idea where I started before I added all this stuff to it, right? This core idea of talking about like making Apple references and three-part structure, because everything I do has to have a three-part structure, um, you know, and Beyonce references, all that stuff, that's a good idea. I think I should stick with that. So I get very excited about that. And then I do the, the most important thing. I throw all of it out, all of it. All that work that I did is gone instantly. Because at this point, I've had enough time for all of this to percolate and sit in my head and sit out of my head and think about it and talk about it that I can walk away from the whole thing if I need to. So in this case, there's a talk that we started with today that had a three-part structure that had examples including Apple and Beyonce and Good Grips, which is another geeky thing that I like, believe it or not. The Good Grips, yeah, the spatulas. Someday I will give a talk about spatulas. <laughs> not today. Um, someday that will happen. I threw that all out, all of it, and started with the new sheet, totally new sheet. And I thought, well, let's, let's see if we can do this like number of things in a talk thing, like right? X number of things in X minutes thing, because I've always wanted to do that. So let's give it a shot. So I tried that idea. And then I build on that idea, right? It starts to really work, right? It's working, right? Um, it's more me. I think that's the important part. I look back at the first draft of this, which was like the first and 15th drafts, let's be honest. And it was not very me. It was a pleasant talk. I was up here talking about other things. Maybe that's why you all left in my nightmare. But it was not very me. It wasn't funny either. I think that's the other thing. Clearly, this is a hilarious talk. You all are. You all are laughing loudly and exactly when you're supposed to. Um, but that's, that's more, much more me than coming up here and talking about Apple, frankly. So that's gone. So I'm feeling really good about this. And start, I start to really refine it, right? I take this idea and, and go with it and hone it in just enough. There's still that part of me that thinks about the crap that I put out initially and says, this has to be perfect. Like, you've thrown out your idea. You've got to start over. This has to be flawless, OK? But then another part of me remembers, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not perfect, obviously. So here I am. This thing I'm going to put out in the world is not perfect either, and that's okay. So I want to get to a level of something that is really just good enough. And most importantly, like anything that I do, because I'm a designer, it's magical, right? Even if it's not perfect, it's magical. So that's the exciting stuff. The next step is the most important step in this process. I get nervous and very excited. I want to put this thing out there. Just on the cusp of it, right? I get to a point where I think it's good enough to share with people. It's good enough to put out there. And I get really excited and nervous about this stuff. Um, when I was waiting over there, where that photographer is, hi there, um, I was shaking. I was really nervous because I was about to do this thing, right? And everybody I've talked to about this um, has said, well, don't you get nervous? And yeah, of course I get nervous. I absolutely get nervous because I'm doing something creative and putting myself out there and trying something different. That's what we do, right? Like the hard part is the feedback that we get and how, that, how we take that and take that in. But we got to make ourselves vulnerable to put something beautiful out in the world. Still makes me nervous, though. And then put it out in the world. It's out there, right? This talk is happening. We are in this talk right now. It is happening. It's out in the world. You've all listened to some of it. There's more. Um, so what happens next? I make a thing, right? I make a wonderful thing, hopefully a wonderful thing. And then <laughs> I freak out. There's no reaction, right? Some people are in the audience right now not laughing. Totally cool. Some people are giggling. Some people are nervous. Some people are like, what is this guy on about? 
Um, so a couple things may happen here. One is that I might be able to put that aside and say, hey, I made a thing, it's great, I'm still happy with it, pretty, pretty proud of this thing I put out in the world, and my ego just comes in and comes back with that confidence that I had, noting, noting after coffee. Um, comes back and says, this is good, this is a good thing you put out there, this is great, so I feel good about it. That can happen. The other thing that can happen is that <laughs> I can put out a snarky comment on Twitter or something about that and quietly say like, oh yeah, I did, like, I did a thing. And just hope that I get some sort of reaction. Because when we're making this stuff, we want that reaction, we want that connection with people, right? No matter what it is, even if I never see the person who uses any of the websites or things that I make, I still wanna make that connection with them because there's a human on the other side. So for me, putting you know, a snarky, self-effacing comment on Twitter is a pretty good way of getting that feedback, honestly. So those are the things that happen. And the last step, my antenna is coming out. The last step um, is the most important step in the process. Okay, <laughs> the most important step. Step twenty-seven. It's to make a memory. So we did this thing, right? We've had this talk. We've had this time together. Um, and there is actually something that I want to bring back from the original talk that didn't happen today. Um, I want to go back to that junk drawer for a minute. Believe it or not. So the story with the junk drawer was this. So the house I grew up in had a kitchen, had a junk drawer, three parts right there. There you go, beautiful. Um, and I remember one day uh, I, I was in the kitchen and my dad was in the dining room, which was adjacent to it. And uh, he said, oh, can you go get me the, uh, there's a pink pencil in there. It's a porky pig pencil in the junk drawer. Can you grab it? I said, sure. I was like seven or so. Did that, brought it over to him. He said, watch this. He holds the pencil. And he starts moving it in a certain way. And it looked like rubber, right? It looked like rubber. I see heads nodding, which is kind of exciting too. Um, it, and, and he did it and I was, my mouth was agape. I was like, how, how are you doing that? Um, and he didn't tell me, right? My dad didn't tell me that. So I grabbed the pencil and I, I held it in my hands and you know, realized, oh yeah, this is, this is a real pencil. Like it's a real thing. I was stupefied. I grabbed a sheet of paper. I started writing with it. I started to like see if the eraser came off or anything like that. Like, is this really rubber? I don't know. Um, and then I tried to do it myself and I could not do it. I could not do it. That was a long time ago. I have tried over the years to do that. Um, I cannot, I cannot do it. I do not know how my dad did that. And I tried doing it with my son one day, pulled out the pencil, and was like, check this out. And, and he was like, yeah, you're moving a pencil. He's like, so what? The important thing there is uh, that my dad didn't go through 27 steps of a creative process. Let's be honest here, right? Maybe, he, I mean, if he did, that would have been cool. But, um, but he did something that was magical. It was totally unexplained and totally unexpected, right? It was just a random day, pulls out a pencil, turns it into rubber, and that's, that's something that's stuck with me for my whole life. And I, you know, as long as I can hold on to that memory as a person, I will, because it was really magical and special. And I think the thing is, is we want things to be explained easily, right? We want a repeatable, easy to use process that we can take, take these 27 steps, do it over here, it's gonna give you the same result every single time without fail. That would be cool. The truth of the matter is that we're always changing as people, right? The person I was two hours ago, I was a little groggier, but I was not up here, I did not give this talk. I'm in a different place now, right? You all are in different places now too. You are not the same people you were yesterday, or a week ago, or a year ago even, things like that. So we're always changing. So we have to be flexible and make sure that our process, these 27 steps, can flex too. They have to, because we're different, right? So if you decide someday that coffee is not a part of your plan, that is totally cool. Take it out of these 27 steps that are otherwise guaranteed to give you creative results. Um, the important thing here, though, is that if I were really to say the most important step in the whole process, for real, is this. We're trying to make a memory here, right? Yeah, the other steps are cool. There's a lot of writing, there's a lot of agony, there's a lot of ecstasy, but this is what we're doing as designers, as creative people, as people who are putting brave and vulnerable stuff out in the world. That is what our art is about. And the more we focus on making memories and connections with people, the more we can do things that really are magical and most importantly, are also repeatable. 
That's my talk. Thank you very much.